You only judge people on the outside for parts on the inside of you that you haven't balanced and loved. The topic today is on a bit of a, I guess you could say an edgy topic called racism, which involves discrimination and prejudice and many other top, subtopics there. And so I'd like to just go off on a bit of a rabbit hole here, go down a rabbit hole and just elaborate on this and put it into a different context. Now, so if you have something to write with or write on, you may be interested in taking some notes. Every human being, regardless of what their background is, their gender spectrum, their culture, et cetera, their age, lives moment by moment by a set of priorities, set of values, things that are most to least important in their life. And that is called the hierarchy of their values. Now, this is evolving and changing, but at any moment, they have a set of values that they're living their life by. And every perception, decision, and action they take is based on it. That's why you probably have noticed that wherever I do seminars, I mention values because it's the foundation of human behavior, the drive of human behavior. Now, what's interesting is anytime we run across another individual, run into them, and have them communicate or do something that we perceive as supporting of our values or challenging of our values, we tend to open up to them or close down to them. And what we found in the study of values is whenever we see more similarities to somebody than differences, we tend to open up. That's how you gain rapport with people if you're communicating and finding common threads. And if you have more differences than similarities, you tend to close down. So when you're infatuate with somebody and admire somebody, if you look very carefully and they list the things they admire about them, they'll find things that are more similar to them than different. And when they're resenting them, they'll have more differences and similarities. And this has been dem demonstrated over and over again in the presentation I do called the Breakthrough Experience, which I've done for many, many decades. And what's interesting is now, Whenever we are supported, we tend to call that the in-group. And whenever we are challenged, we tend to call that the out-group. We tend to seek and we want to be attracted and open up to them or repel and want to avoid them and, um, you know, get away, you might say. One is an impulse towards, one is an instinct away. One is seeking, one is avoiding. One's attraction, one's repulsion. And when we are similar, we tend to have a tendency in our brain, in our amygdala, our subcortical area of our amygdala, even though it's in the telencephalon, we tend to have a desire for them versus a desire away from them. And we have a subjective bias that we tend to accentuate to create an attraction, an adrenaline to get closer to them. Just like if we're infatuate, we got to be with them. And when we are subjectively biased in a way that sees differences and we want, to, we want to get away from them. And we do that as a protective mechanism, a survival mechanism uh, to get food, prey, and to avoid predator. Because anything that supports our values represents prey in our brain. Anything that challenges our values represents predator in our brain. And so we go into a subjective bias, a survival response to make sure we don't starve and make sure we don't get eaten. And so anytime somebody accelerates either one of those sides by doing things that we support, that support our values and our perception or challenge our values, we tend to have this polarization. This subjective bias tends to accelerate and accentuate and subjectively bias and opinionate us and increases our prejudice. And so our amygdala in our brain is sort of our prejudice center. And so anything that supports it, we tend to be prejudiced towards the in-group and we tend to you know, it's almost like if you're in a political arena, for instance, and you're on one side or the other of this spectrum, left to right, you might say, you tend to think, well, our group is the right group and the other group's the wrong group. And we tend to moralize this and polarize our perceptions and subjectively bias our perceptions because of this. And we end up having prejudice. Now, prejudice many times associated with discriminating against, but actually prejudice can be towards. You can be prejudiced and think, well, anybody that's similar to me, I'm gonna give more favor to, and anybody that's different, not. Even parents, when they're raising children, may have, you might say, the, 
the individual child that is a little bit more easy to get along with versus the one that's difficult, one that's more obedient versus defiant, and one that supports and challenges, and we tend to favor it. And we don't like to admit this, but we sometimes have fluctuating favoritisms going on in our own family, dealing with own children based on when it supports and challenges our individual values. So there's no human being that doesn't have this kind of prejudice and this bias and this subjective bias state. We tend to see things that support our values with confirmation biases on the positive side and disconfirmation bias on the negative. And when we see things that challenge our values, we have a confirmation bias on the negative and a disconfirmation bias on the positive. A false positive on the positives when we're admiring them and a false positive on the negatives when we're despising them. We're seeing things that aren't there or that, are, that aren't there and we're not seeing things that are there. And we, we bias this. Now this could be anything that supports or challenges us, we could be doing this with. So let me give you some samples of this. This could be political. Anybody that's similar to us in political views, we can be a bias towards. Anybody that goes against us in political views, we can be biased against. So we can have a mechanism of a bias and a prejudice discrimination uh, based on that topic. And believe it or not, under the topic of racism, part of race uh, it could be many variables. A lot of the issues that we hear about racism isn't about anybody different because we're all homo sapiens. We're all the human being that's a homo sapien. Anytime we can procreate with somebody, it's the same species. So it's not really about anything other than these other discrimination factors that we have. So it could be political. You could actually associate combinations of variables that can make a discrimination, a prejudice that could be classified, subclassified sort of as racism and not even be about a particular uh, culture or color or anything like that. Color could be one, culture could be another, political affiliation could be another, uh, sex could be another one, or the spectrum of where they are in the sex, if it supports or challenges your views. It could be uh, gender, the way you're demonstrating your, not just sexuality, your sexual preferences, but your gender preferences could be part of that. You could actually have belief systems. They believe that uh, money's good, and you agree with them and versus money's bad or something. It could be uh, values, individual values, people that have similar values get along easier and people that have different similar values may not. It could be social classes, where you are in a socioeconomic uh, position, the way you dress, the what you drive. Uh, anything that's similar or different can create these amygdala responses and have a subjective bias and we can be discriminative and we can be prejudiced and we can now classify these people and we create the same biologic response. And we could actually create something we would die for on the people that support us, or we would de demonstrate almost a genocide or a killing on something that goes against us. It could be taken to those extremes in some cases because of its supportive or challenging of our values. We could have people that are in different social classes. In other words, we could have disabilities. I saw a gentleman just yesterday that I was interested in wanting to go talk to that I happened to be driving by. But when I came back on the drive, I actually wanted to get out and actually have a chat with him. But he had a physical deformities and he was sitting out and waving to everybody as people going by. And I thought, what an amazing situation. But I could see that many people would probably be uh, awkward interacting with him because of the physical deformity he has, but he was extremely friendly. So he's doing one thing that's supporting it and another thing that might be challenging to a value system, counterbalancing it. So there's a heart that opens. Whenever you, it's been shown that whenever there's a balance of support and challenge in our perception, it tends to open a heart and be grateful. Maximum growth and development occurs at the border of support and challenge. But when we see more support than challenge or more challenge support, we tend to be prejudiced and biased and create these opinions of people that are usually distortions, exaggerations. We're not seeing both sides. In fact, if you look carefully, every human being has got another side and every trait that we can never judge in somebody also has another side. I've been teaching the Breakthrough Experience program, which is my signature program for three, three, three decades and few, two, three years now. And um, I've seen people come in with these prejudices and these challenges and these racial issues and discriminations, and they walk out dissolved because what we've done is we've taken those nitpicky things that they're judging those little bitty components and sometimes it's more than one and we are neutralizing them by having reflective awareness and owning it 
because the reality is that we only judge things on the outside that represent parts of us that we're judging on the inside, but we're unconscious of it. We're too proud or too humble to admit we have what we see in other people in our form. And then we think ours is better or worse. And our amygdala tends to want to make us proud and project our valuations onto people and assume that's reality. And a generalization is born. A lot of discriminations are just generalizations that are not even facts. They're preconceptions of what people are because of these associations we made in our brain. Our subconscious mind stores all previous experiences. So if we met a, an individual that's a woman, that's blonde or whatever, and we had this experience, we'll stack that in our subconscious mind. And now we'll be on the lookout in case we see another blonde or with those behaviors. And then we can then judge accordingly. And these are accumulated in there. They're not facts about people. They're just opinions about people. But we could also have disability as a factor to discriminate between capacity. You know, we now have uh, the Special Olympics, right? The, uh, where all of a sudden people that have challenged uh, capacities physically have gone and excelled and done some extraordinary capacities. I had a lovely, amazing woman in my program, the Breakthrough Experience, who was a gold medalist um, in a particular field. And um, she was in a wheelchair and she did amazing things. So that was once a discrimination. Now it's been neutralized because people are now realizing, wow, they've done an extraordinary thing. But that could be a source of discrimination, disability. It could also be your own sexuality, not just your sexual behavior, but your sexuality as you're perceived, your gender positioning, as I've said. You could actually have where you actually come from part of the world. It could be a location geographically. They could do it. You come from that geography. There's presuppositions that people have from past experiences. And these past experiences may not be our own experience. It may be the mothers, fathers, preachers, teachers, conventions, traditions, or mores of our particular culture versus a different culture. And somebody from the past may have had a, a bias about something, and we're now taking it on and inculcating it into our experience without even ever having an experience. And I, I found that that uh, can be carried down just from that ethnicity. We can have language. I notice when somebody's speaking the same language, you tend to be open up to them. When they speak a different language, you tend to close down. You feel more proximal or distal from that. That's not, unless you know it. Now, when you know a language, I, I love when I go in and I have, uh, I was in Houston, I had a, a Japanese uh, airline come in with a whole crew. And um, I said, arigato to all the, um, to the, the people that I saw. And they all smiled and they arigato and everything else because I knew one word, I warmed up a communication there. Otherwise I would have probably a distance from. So it could be language. It could be nationality, as I've said, or geography. It can be complexion. You could have rough skin, smooth skin, frizzy hair, uh, dark hair, uh, smooth skin, smooth hair. There's different complexions that could happen. Beauty. I know I've fallen, without a doubt, I've fallen to that. I've seen myself interact with people sometimes that are attractive in my ideas. Somebody else may not seem as attractive, but they'll be attracted to my ideas. They meet my search image. And I notice that I'm a little bit more open to them than somebody that doesn't match my search image. So I can see that I have that. I don't think anybody escapes these prejudices or these sort of racial behaviors. That's why I don't think it's wise to point our finger at somebody else about race. I think it's wise to take a look at ourselves and realize that we all have these variables that we're dealing with as a human behavior. And we don't wanna you know, judge somebody else because if we wanna look at our own, point the finger at ourselves, pluck the mode out of your own eye before you pluck it out of somebody else as the old biblical statement said. But it could be beauty, it could be height. <laughs> I've uh, seen people that are very short or very tall and I've seen them being discriminated and opinionated. Oh, you could never do that because you're too short. I had a woman that became a very beautiful supermodel uh, but she wasn't as tall as the other ones, but she had a flare and a magnetism that counterbalanced it. So there were two different variables that people were judging by, but we can be judging people by height. We could judge people by occupation. Uh, I, I watched that happen one time when I walked into a restaurant in Chicago. I had just come in from doing a seminar, it was about midnight, and we were the only place we could find to eat is this little taco place. We went in there and there was some, quote, blue collar versus white collar. And I watched people all of a sudden when some white collar people sat next to some blue collar people, the blue collar people that were talking quieted down. And I watched that behavior because they, them, and it didn't start until they saw the white collar. So you can have discrimination against uh, social positioning in business that could be a factor. 
And they and what's interesting is the, the they could be very friendly on other areas. Some of these other areas that might be discriminative might not even be a factor, might get along and have great friendships because they both like soccer. And that could be another one, sports. I have seen people that go, I don't believe in that, that sport. I, I, that's a crazy sport. They could have discrimination on sports. It could be on levels of education. It could be on criminality. Oh, uh, I was in prison. Oh, well, I don't want to ever talk to you because you were in prison. But yet I've met some people in prison that went out and did something extraordinary with their life and did philanthropic things and built businesses that were extraordinary. So we sometimes have discrimination on something of that nature. It could be sport team affiliation. Uh, I, I saw people fighting over a baseball game because of, of somebody said something about derogatory about the baseball uh, players and that team and that city. It could also be music taste. I've seen people that can condemn people that do rock and roll and then other people that condemn classic. Uh, that could be a discriminant factors. Then you could also have character, physical character traits, just physical traits, big nose, buck teeth, uh, uh, small bottoms, big bottoms, big breasts. I've seen men have biases and discrimination and almost attractions or repulsions on uh, body size and proportions. I don't think anybody escapes some of these things. And various behaviors and mannerisms, uh, accent of language can be a part of it. Now, if you take all of these different variations, and I've just mentioned a few, there's a way, there's, there's probably thousands of different things that we could be discriminating between people. And these sometimes are compounded. You may find that eight or 10 of those are things that challenge your values and you now discriminate against somebody. And it's because of, not because of what has been classified as it, color-based possibly. That may be, you may, I had a gentleman who was, um, had a darker melanin pigment and was one of the most intelligent individuals I met, had a grand business, massive business, was contributing philanthropically and everything else. And I was sitting there, I was looking up to this guy. I was going, what an amazing man this is. I was, and I was looking at a whole lot of criteria and it was, and it didn't matter what uh, pigment levels they had. It was just an astonishing, brilliant individual. I was fascinated by this man. So you can actually have some things that you're discriminating for under one person and then a completely different set another because these over here are counterbalancing those over here. So the very net of all the things that you admire or despise or like or dislike or look up to or down on or attract or repel that support or challenge your value system is going to lead you to react with a prejudice towards or prejudice away, or if you balance them and completely balance that equation, just open your heart to them. Because it's been shown that when you have a balanced equation, uh, open heart occurs. I've been teaching the breakthrough experience, uh, my signature program for many years now, as I said, and I do in there a Demartini method. It's the, it's the method I do to be able to ask a series of questions. I'd like to go through those questions to show how it could be helpful in this particular topic. Uh, you, you take a trait, you, you ask this question, what specific trait, action, or inaction do you perceive this individual displaying or demonstrating that you admire most, that's an impulse towards, or despise most, an impulse away, that you're discriminating and you're prejudiced on, but you may not call it racial, but it is a form of racism in a sense, but it's just a different criteria that's, that's adding up. And you write that down, what that is. Then you ask this question to yourself. Go to Go to a moment self, where and when I perceive myself displaying or demonstrating that particular trait, action, or inaction. And you identify where it was, when it was, who it was demonstrated in, in front of, and who perceived it, or to. And then you stack that up and you keep looking until you see it's quantitatively and qualitative equal to what you see in them. At first, you're going to go, no, I don't do that, because you're too proud or too humble to admit what you see in others inside you. But if you actually look and hold yourself accountable to balance the equation, which I've done in over 100,000 people, I assure you that you only judge people on the outside for parts on the inside of you that you haven't balanced and loved. And that's really realization. So really all the people out there that we have these discriminations of seeking and avoiding to are really our teachers. They're there to try to teach us how to love the parts of us we haven't owned and loved in our life. And I've demonstrated in the breakthrough experience. And if you've never been to it, it's an amazing experience to realize that everybody out there, nobody's worth putting on pedestals or pits. Everybody's worth putting in hearts. And any part you don't have in the heart is a part you don't love in yourself. 
when you got to be able to own all parts of yourself, the hero, the villain, the virtue and the vice, all of it inside you, if you really want to love your life. And any part you don't is the button you push that you're too proud or too humble to admit. And there's your discrimination, your prejudice for and against as a result of it. So we go in there and I identify where we do it and we find out um, exactly till it's the same degree. And at first you think that's not possible, but I've been demonstrating it for three decades and in, in, well, 33 years almost. In, in March will be 33 years. I've been demonstrating that ownership and how proof, proven that is to many, many thousands of people. Then we go in there and take the trait we admire that we look up to and we ask, what are the downsides? How is it a disservice to me? And we take the traits we despise and we go, what are the upsides and how is it a service to me? And we level the playing field because no behavior is, is, is anything but neutral until our subjective biases and our narrow mindedness label it because of our own subconscious wounds that we've had in the past. Once we go in there and find the downsides of what we have up, we calm down the infatuation and the prejudice towards. And once we find the benefits of that we think is down that we resent, that's the prejudice, uh, and discrimination and avoidance, we now open up. And then when we open up and see that we're equals to that, that we're not fearing the loss of these people or fearing the gain of these people, which cause our autonomic response of fight or flight or rest and digest. And we're able to love and appreciate people and have resilience and adaptability. And we actually benefit because we live longer with that. Our immune system is enhanced. The pro and anti-inflammatory systems are balanced. The heart rate variability in our, in our body is expanded and we don't react. We don't have a reaction. We get to see people objectively. Objectivity means neutral, not polarized, not biased. And by doing the method, and there's a series of questions one by one that I explained in the Breakthrough Experience on doing the method that allows to dissolve it. I have seen people that are enraged with people when they literally almost kill them. They, 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 at least that's the language. They probably wouldn't do it, but they add a language. I'd like to kill it. They're literally enraged and they go and do the method and they're in tears of gratitude and put their arms around them. I was in uh, literally in Dublin, Ireland, and I had the opportunity to work with the president of Ireland and they put together a pilot study with where we took uh, three women who had their family members killed by the three people that killed them. And they're in the same room separated by a security system. And I had them do the method. And there was a massive discrimination between, in this case, uh, a various religious group from the Northern and Southern Ireland group, and, um, you know, the Catholics and the Protestants. And here we have all of a sudden in clash. And then when we got through at the end of the time we did the method, they were hugging each other, mind-blowingly hugging, even though this individual is the one in prison for killing that person's family member. They, they couldn't even comprehend that. And it was, it transcended prejudice, it transcended discrimination, it transcended this so-called racial construct. And it was amazing to watch. And I, and I, the reason I'm men mentioning this and talking about this topic is because that tool is a gold mine for people who find themselves emotion reacting and not wanting to be reactive, but find themselves reactive because they've got subconsciously stored uh, wounds or fantasies and nightmares sitting in their minds because of associations of support and challenge in their values over time. And if you don't have your own governance to be able to do that, you will react probably. And we don't want to admit it, but we actually have these emotional reactions and these discriminations and prejudices and, and um, racial concerns, because I really believe that racism is not just about color or nationality or whatever. It's any of those variables. We can get the same behaviors that we've classified that because of all these variables, intelligent levels and and the, what we dress, I've seen people because the way they dress, I've seen people with tattoos and non-tattoos. I've seen people that have fake smiles and personas. Oh, they're the, I've seen every imaginable type of variable, but all of it boils down to a trait we're too proud or too humble to admit we have. When we actually have reflective awareness, true reflective awareness is what I call intimacy. Intimacy is when you actually realize that everything you see in them, you have in you. And you're not resisting it, you're not attracted or repelled from it, you're just honoring it in both individuals. When you can value their value system as much as your value system, you've mastered your life. You have equanimity between within yourself and equity between yourself and others, which is the greatest place to have sustainable fair exchange. 
and that helps you. I've seen this discrimination in types of businesses. I've seen discrimination in income levels, as I've said. I've seen it in where you are in the in the business, whether you're a worker, or whether you're an owner, or a blue collar, white collar. All of those have nothing to do with it. And my dad, I have to say, my dad, when I was about four years old, my dad was trying to give me an insight about this because he had me go out and work. I was my, my dad owned a plumbing business. And he had me go out and work with a gentleman who was the ditch digger. And it was interesting. And I said, well, I, I'd like to work with the plumber. And he says, no, I want you to go out with a ditch digger. And the reason he did is because he knew I would learn something from this, this ditch digger. He knew I would learn and not to put people into different categories so much. And I went out there and, and I learned so much from him because he was the most, he was a master ditch digger. And his goal was to be able to dig a ditch, repair a pipe and put it down and put the sods of the, the, the grass back in place and put a water main in from the street to the, the house so perfectly that the people would call and said, well, you didn't come. And, I, and he said, well, we did come and it's all installed. And but he wanted to make sure that it was so perfectly done and so uh, masterfully done. And he said to me, and I was driving home with him back to the to the my well, not my home, but to to the office. And I said, he said to me, he says, you know, I had the greatest job in the world. And I said, how so? Because I'm thinking he's a ditch digger. He said, because without me, people die. I bring water, and without water, we die. And his perception brought tears to my eyes thinking about it. Here's a guy that's not necessarily socioeconomically at the top, but intellectually caring, personality, love. Uh, as far as a human being, he was an amazing human being. And so the ratios of all those judgments and all those variables we could uh, imagine, if they're balanced, we get to love the individual. And sometimes we get caught on one or two little issues and narrow our mind to one little trivial things in life instead of look at the whole picture and find the balance and own the traits we see in others. If you can take the hero and the villain on the outside and realize that within yourself and level the playing field and have equity between you and other people, the prejudice, the racial discriminations, and all those things tend to melt away. And so I just want to do a special presentation on that topic. And I hope that people will consider joining me at the Breakthrough Experience to learn how to do this method, because this method is a gold mine. It was amazing what it can do for people. And I've seen it help thousands of people because we all have it. We, every one of us here have moments of discriminations and prejudices. And the more we're living by our highest value, the reason I, I tell people to make sure you fill your day with the highest priority actions and delegate lower priority distractions is because when you're living by your highest value, you're most objective, most neutral, least judging. Think of a day when you got something done that was amazing. It was the highest priority things. You really knocked it out of the ballpark on your productivity and how resilient you were and how adapted you were when you came home. And then think of a day when you had to do low priority stuff. You were putting fires out. You go, my God, I didn't get what I wanted to get done. And how volatile you were and how emotional and reactive you were when you got home. You, when you're in your executive center, you're more objective and reason. And you're, you're thinking before emotional reacting. When you're in your amygdala, you're more likely to emotional react before you think and more likely to be prejudiced. So, and the same thing when it comes to uh, when you're doing something that's sustainable and fair exchange, you grow your wealth. And when you have more economic uh, systems and you have more stability, you're also more likely to be understanding of people, more philanthropic. So I'm a firm believer that this tool, the De Martini Method can help people transcend these accumulated variables that we stack up supportive or challenging to our values that are in a sense stopping us from getting to love another human being, which is nothing but a reflection of ourselves. We're not loving in ourselves. So if you'd love to love yourself more, learning to do the method can help you transcend some of these things that we're trapped in. I have without a doubt been trapped finding my prejudices and my discriminations. But every time I've done the method on when I become aware of them cognitively, they dissolve. And it gives me the freedom to now realize people, because I travel all over the world. I've been to 163 countries in my life, and I get to meet people of all different walks of life, and I've yet to see anybody that's not caring enough to want to go and raise a beautiful family, try to make a difference in the world, make a contribution in the world. Deep inside, we all want to do something that's meaningful, that makes a difference in the world, way down inside. But when we don't know how to manage our state, don't know how to live by priority, and don't know how to neutralize some of our things, we can accumulate this to such a degree that we can go to these extremes 
that we have seen sometimes on television and the media likes to promote. And uh, I'm a firm believer that um, anything you don't love in the people around you is a part of the things you don't love in yourself. Give yourself permission to love yourself. When you're living authentically, according to your highest value, uh, you have the highest probability of getting to surround yourself with amazing people that you get to love. So I just want to talk about racism for a minute and the discrimination and prejudice that are associated with it, which has sometimes uh, 50 variables that are adding up and we sometimes confuse what we're even upset about. And we haven't really broke it down. But if we actually go in there and neutralize them all, use the Demartini method and learn to live by priority in life, which is why I tell people to go on my website and do the value determination process and live by top priority um, and learn the method because it will definitely increase the probability of you having resilience, adaptability and a longer life potential. So that's my presentation. I'm glad that you were able to keep up with me. Hope you took some notes. I uh, hope this was stimulating in some way. And I look forward to seeing you at our next presentation. Um, that's there to help you do something extraordinary with your life. Mm -hmm.